Hello, I'm Sarah K. Byerly, and we are here at Gettysburg for the 159th anniversary of the battle. We are out on what's now called Barlow's Knoll. It was called Blocker's Knoll in 1863. It's an area of the battlefield that's not as visited, but you've got to come out here if you are visiting Gettysburg. I'll tell you a little secret. It is one of my favorite places on the battlefield um, because there aren't a lot of crowds out here. And there's a nice roadway that you can walk along. There's monuments to see. In fact, you can probably see a monument over my shoulder here. This is the monument to Union General Francis Channing Barlow. He's in his late 20s at the time of the battle, Harvard graduate. He was trying to be a lawyer in New York City and uh, the war comes. He enlists in April 1861, um, rises through the ranks by 1862. He's colonel of the 61st New York, uh, promotes to brigadier general after the Battle of Antietam where he helps to break the sunken road. And by the time we get here to Gettysburg, he is commanding the first division of the 11th Corps. He's not very popular with his men. Um, he does not like German Americans. He has a lot of prejudice against them. He says not very nice things about them in his letters. And in return, his men say terrible things about him. They call him names. They wish he would fall off the face of the earth. It's just a terrible leadership followership situation that's happening in the Gettysburg campaign. And it's going to kind of come to a climax out here where we're standing. Now I'm going to shift around so you can start seeing part of the land because we're standing on the rising part. Off to my left, we have Rock Creek, which you're probably going to get to see in a later video, or maybe you've already seen it. Um, Behind me, you have Oak Ridge, um, which is of course out by Seminary Ridge, where you've got the early part of the first day of the battle. Now around midday, early afternoon, the Union 11th Corps is coming into Gettysburg. They're gonna be sent out here north of town and Barlow is going to make a decision to move out to this promontory um, to take this high ground area. And it's a very controversial thing. It's debated. Barlow gets maligned to this day for that decision. But as you look around, as you stand out here on Barlow's Knoll, ask yourself, where else does he go? And if he's not being given clear directions, which is kind of suggested by some of the primary sources that we have, where is he going to go? What choice does he have? Does he pick the best of all the worst options? Well, it turns out to be a really bad option because from the north, we've got Confederate divisions coming and not just one, but a whole core. It's the second core of the Army of Northern Virginia, and they are going to come toward Gettysburg and who is in their way on this little knoll sticking out from the rest of the army. You guessed it, Francis Barlow. He is in a bad place at a very bad time. His men do put up a fight, not enough for him. He is one of the hardest fighters in the Army of the Potomac. He'll say they ran away really quick. Other sources suggest we've got some regiments that fight really hard out here. There's also artillery that engages. There's artillery that's trying to stop this Confederate advance but there's not enough a cannon, there's not enough infantry out here with all the Confederates converging on this area. And as most of you probably know, the 11th Corps is gonna break, fall back into town. General Howard is gonna rally them on Cemetery Hill and start building that new line. Now, as for Francis Barlow himself, he's gonna get wounded out here. Um, there's a incident, there's a story that Confederates found him. Maybe it was General John B. Gordon, maybe it was other officers. Barlow himself, isn't real clear about it. Um, he does. He remembers some officers' names, but not others. I think it's because he was in a lot of pain. Um, he is descriptive about his wound. Um, I think he's just not remembering things by the time he gets to that letter. Anyway, he'll be taken to the Josiah Benner farm. He's a prisoner. He'll be taken care of. He's so badly wounded, the Confederates leave him behind when they retreat at the end of the battle. Um, he will, he'll recover from his wound, go on to fight in later battles of the Army of the Potomac. But we're here on location, so we're not going to talk about what happens in the later years with Barlow. We want to talk about some artillery. Now there's lots of artillery that's out here. As I mentioned before, it's not enough. But out here on the very point of the knoll, we've got a battery. And Brian Cheeseborough is going to tell us a little bit more about what happens to some of the artillerymen out here. Once again, thanks everybody for joining us. I'm just gonna do a reading from a, a book of a book I have my, from my library. 
and this is the Time Life series, Voices of the Civil War, and this is the Gettysburg volume of those books. These books are out of print, so if you're going to look for them, you might want to try eBay or Amazon or a used bookstore or a thrift store or whatever. But anyway, I just want to read the account from Major Thomas W. Osborne, the Chief of Artillery of the 11th Corps. Okay, so he, it was a, he was a law student from Jefferson County, New York, and Osborne volunteered in 1861 and swiftly rose to command the 11th Corps Artillery. The late afternoon attack of Jubal Early, Jubal Early's Confederates flanked Howard's 11th Corps along the Harrisburg Road, and as that fragmented, as we learned, Osborne's batteries waged a valiant and costly rear guard action. And so here's the account of that. I again turned to Wilkinson's battery, where I met Wilkinson, Wilkinson after being carried to the rear by his men on a stretcher. One leg had been cut off at the knee by a cannon shot. He finished cutting him off himself. He spoke to me and was cheerful and hopeful. I knew at a glance that the wound was fatal. There was no time for me to stop, and after talking with him, perhaps a quarter of, of a half or half a minute, I left him. I never saw him again, as he died a few hours later. I soon hurried on to the front, where I found the battery engaged in line with Barlow's division. The lines of battle were in the open field and very close together. The enemy's line overlapped, ours to a considerable extent on both flanks. Lieutenant Bancroft was in command of Wilkinson's battery and doing good work. I knew that the two divisions must soon fall back or we would, or would be drawn back. I gave Bancroft what instructions were necessary and returned to get the other four batteries into satisfactory positions. A few moments, moments after I left the line, General Barlow was seriously wounded and fell into the hands of the enemy. And here is the illustration of Lieutenant Baird Wilkinson, Wilkinson 19-year-old commander of Battery G, 4th US, U.S. Artillery, directing his guns on Barlow's Knoll on the Federal right. After this, he was struck by a shell, and he had to finish himself cutting off his own leg with a pocket knife. Uh, that's a... Uh, I know that many Civil War soldiers were in shock when their legs were completely severed off by shells or, or, or whatever. Um, and just to imagine what it must have been like out here to very coolly cut your own leg off, to have the presence of mind to do that. It's just really staggering. Um, I don't really know what else to say. So back to you, Gary. All right, thanks so much, Brian. And thanks, Sarah. Uh, I have two things to say. One, I can already, I, I can only picture the comments right now. Maybe you guys should have a windscreen. We do, we have human blockers trying to block the wind. You can see it's a windy day. But let me take it down a little bit here because Baird Wilkinson is taken uh, when Osborne apparently may have ran into him. He was taken back to the Elms House. That's basically the poor house, the indigent house, whose cemetery you might be able to see past Barlow's Monument over there. That's the Elms House Cemetery. And he's over there um, and, and dies in that spot. And somebody comes upon him. He's a newspaper correspondent. You may have heard the story before. He's a newspaper correspondent from New York trying to tell the story of the great battle, but he says something to the effect of, how can I tell the story of a great battle when the singular focus in front of me is the body of my own eldest son, sent to a place where um, he should never have been sent and left to, a, to die in a place where surgeons dare not go. Um, uh, just imagine um, that how personal this war becomes to somebody who's experiencing such loss, yet there for another pur purpose to tell that story. And it brings up what Sarah said at the beginning, where he shouldn't have been sent in the first place. Was that Barlow? Was that General Howard? Was it his own decision to set up right here? And was it a good or a bad idea, even though they lost? You can ponder that stuff on your own, but that has to be one of the most moving newspaper accounts of the Civil War. So thank you so much for watching. Thanks to Sarah, thanks to Brian, and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.